Hello and welcome to This Is Portsmouth, the show that is about the UK's only island city. My name's Alana and today I have Amelia joining me here in the studio. We have a jam-packed show for you today, so stay tuned for what's to come because, because this, this is, is Portsmouth. Portsmouth. Thank you for joining us and a very warm welcome to everyone watching. If you haven't tuned into the show before, we cover a range of topics from community to sport, local businesses and lots more, all centred in the beautiful island city of Portsmouth. So here's what we've got coming up on the show today. We'll be taking a look at the new Ravelin Sports Centre that's set to open later this year and all the amazing facilities inside that will be on offer to the Portsmouth community. We'll then be speaking to the owner of Wild Time, a local independent whole food shop, and what they have on offer to the people of Portsmouth. We'll find out how the local music industry is turning the volume back up after the COVID-19 pandemic by speaking to local artist Tom Wells. We'll also be looking at the amazing charity album being put together to help raise money for Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust. And finally, we're taking a step back in time with a visit to the D-Day Museum and the brand new exhibition that will be opening soon. But first, as facilities across the country start to open up again, a brand new state-of-the-art leisure centre is currently being built and is set to open later this year in the heart of Portsmouth. With everyone being shut indoors for the best part of the year, the Ravelling Sports Centre couldn't be opening at a better time. This is the new Ravelling Sports Centre a brand new sustainable sports facility that's set to open later this year. With an aesthetically pleasing and environmentally friendly design, this facility is like no other in Portsmouth. But it's not the outside of this centre that we're interested in, it's the huge variety of facilities inside that really set it apart from the rest. From state-of-the-art sport equipment to a cafe and community spaces, this centre certainly has something for everyone. The public can pretty much do anything that students can do. That includes our eight lane, 25 metre swimming pool, our eight court sports hall, um, 175 stated gym. Um, we've got three fitness studios where all our classes will take place. Um, and then we've also got kind of breakout spaces. Um, obviously we've got ski simulator, uh, climbing wall, squash courts, and uh, yeah, all sorts of exciting stuff. A lot of the facilities around the area are, are limited on the actual facilities that they've got. Ravelin Sports Centre is going to um, have some of those facilities that our, our competitors don't necessarily have. And the cafe will be kind of based in reception that people can get drinks afterwards. Um, the underground car park will be able to be used for the public. I usually train like five days a week in the gym. I tend to do a lot of like strength and conditioning stuff, but also a bit of cardiovascular stuff. Um, outside the gym, I sea swim most days, um, or go running or cycling, and then at the weekends, I'll be sailing every weekend. <laughs> the most appealing sort of facility in a leisure centre is definitely a pool for me. Um, the idea of not having to swim in the sea is quite nice. It's going to be It'll be quite a unique swimming pool. You can set up different lanes for different depths, so children will be able to swim in the kind of shallower um, lanes. You can set the whole pool to be shallow, the whole pool to be deep, um, so it's, it's great for children, adults, beginners, experts. I think uh, Ravin Sports Centre brings a lot to Portsmouth in the design, first of all, they've made it fit in with the local area in terms of the terracotta cladding, as opposed to making it stand out, which I think will um, allow the community to get involved and use the facilities as well as the students and create more of a community throughout Portsmouth. I 
think what makes it stand out is that there's everything there. So you've got the swimming pool, you've got the climbing, you've got um, squash courts, everything's in one place. Makes it really accessible for people rather than driving to one location to do one sport and one location for another. So I think it brings a bit of excitement to the city. With like COVID and stuff, people maybe were active in the beginning um, and then maybe have tailed off a little bit. So I think this brings a, an extra kind of excitement around that people should want to get back into the facilities um, yeah, and, and try a load of new activities. You know, I didn't even realise that a virtual skiing centre was a thing. Do you think you're going to go and check it out once it opens? I mean, I've never been skiing, so I feel like it'll be a great way to introduce me to the slopes a bit more. <laughs> now, tying nicely in with the health focus, we'll now be hearing from Kelly, the owner of an independent whole food shop, Wild Time. Many would say that we need to start adapting to a zero waste lifestyle and in turn protect our environment and the way we live. Yep, and to top it off, everything on offer is vegan, organic and locally sourced. Wild Time Whole Foods is a worker cooperative whole food shop down here in Palmerston Road in South Sea. Uh, we specialise in uh, whole foods obviously, but vegan, gluten free, specialised diets, fair trade. We've achieved the zero waste policy quite successfully because everybody that works here uh, is invested in uh, making a sustainable business. Zero waste is about climate change in terms of reducing, reusing and recycling as it conserves natural resources and minimises pollution. A rapid change in the climate will affect the lives of humans and all living species as well as water and food supplies. Here are a few things that can be done to achieve a zero waste lifestyle. Donate to your local thrift shop, you'll provide resources to your community who are wanting to buy second hand. Try swapping disposables for reusables, for example, refillable bottles and long-life non-plastic shopping bags. And try to buy food that doesn't have packaging. Use jars to fill with nuts, seeds and rice from your local whole food store and farmer's market. If you're trying to uh, look at reducing your waste, then I would say baby steps and really don't beat yourself up if you do the wrong thing. So, you know, start off with the easy things to refill uh, washing up liquid, laundry liquid, household items like that. And then as you go along, you can kind of look to change over other items that you might use in your house. You don't have to do everything all at once. Um, you probably find that a little bit overwhelming maybe um, and like I said you know if you forget your washing up bottle to refill but you really need washing up liquid and you've got to get something like don't beat yourself up about it it's doing the best that we can not being perfect. Being environmentally friendly does not mean worrying about plastic it requires making changes with everyday choices that will save the environment such as reducing pollution and protecting wildlife or even conserving natural resources. Everybody that works here uh, is invested in uh, making a sustainable business. Uh, we're all, our personal ethos is aligned with that. Um, and so it's just meant that, you know, we've got the passion and the drive to be able to implement that. And also we work with wholesalers that have the same ethics as us too. So they already have a lot of the zero waste lines and dispensers and things like that set up. So the pandemic started last year and the shop actually got a lot busier because of that. Uh, during the first lockdown our shelves were just being cleared out every single day and it's been really nice to see that since then people have kind of uh, stayed loyal to us and we've got a lot of new customers from that and the shop is kind of staying busy because of it. Being a whole food store as well as a zero waste store just means that we do have a range of everything. Um, we're trying to obviously cater to a wide audience with a different range of needs so we want to make sure that we are able to provide for our customers in that way uh, but the two things really really do go hand in hand if you're into whole foods anyway most of the items that you're going to want like lentils pulses pastas rice they're items that are really easy to like uh, refill and provide for that and same with um, things like your household items 
Try to primarily buy in bulk or secondhand, but if you must buy new, avoid plastic. Much of it gets shipped across the world for recycling and often ends up in landfill, or worse, the ocean. Find a compost system that works for your home. Not sure how to compost? First, select your food scraps like fruit and veg, pile together your brown waste such as leaves, soil, wood shavings, and then stir it up and feed your garden with nutrients. Portsmouth's Recycling Centre is open seven days a week and is located at Paul's Grove Portway in Port Solent. Head over to the Hampshire County Council website to find out more about what you can and cannot recycle. An attempt at going zero waste starts with small changes. It's within anyone's reach and change starts at home. All that food looks amazing and it's so great that everything is completely organic and locally sourced. And after watching that, I hope it's inspired you at home to consider living a more zero waste lifestyle. It really has. And I think I'm going to go and visit that store. Right, take my container, go and visit, get some pasta. Do you know what? I might join you. We should probably go after this. Great idea. We'll go after the show. Now, it's time to move on. And as lockdown restrictions are starting to ease, and it will be hopefully staying that way, Portsmouth's thriving music industry has been able to turn the volume up and make a comeback. Artists and music venues across the country have been affected since the UK went into lockdown in March 2020. And artist Tom Wells is one of them. He spoke to us about how the pandemic affected him and other artists, as well as his hopes now that lockdown is lifting. Portsmouth is a city full of culture, with attractions like the historic Dockyard and the King's Theatre. Music is also an important part of Portsmouth's culture with most residents recognising names of venues like the Wedgwood Rooms. However, the recent pandemic has wrenched the gig made income from both the hands of artists and venues. With a £1.57 billion rescue package announced for the arts and culture industry, there is hope for the artists of Portsmouth. Tom Wells, a Haven-based musician who has performed and worked in Portsmouth many times, talks about the impacts that losing such venues would have as well as what they mean to you. Um, so I'm Tom Wells and uh, I'm a songwriter and producer and I make music under the name Fast Trains. I've been following the work that the Music Venue Trust do and they're the ones who um, put the industry on kind of red alert and, and all these, um, all of these venues that could quite easily have closed um, over the, over the pandemic, so we're quite fortunate that a lot of those have survived. There's only been a handful really that have, sh have shut down. So they've done some brilliant work and that's been pushing the government for funding and speaking out on behalf of these venues, which is so important to, um, not just to people who go to the gigs, but also to the bands, you know, you're removing the bottom rung if you take those away. So the big artists that are headlining the festivals now have all gone through the circuit of the lower, the lower venues, these independent venues, and they're all run by very passionate people who aren't in it for the money, they're in it because they enjoy music. So to lose that would have been awful, it would have really, really, really affected the industry, and luckily they're opening back up now. I know most venues are open now for socially distanced shows. Um, the Wedge is opening June? I think June, July. Um, we're one of the first shows back in July, I think. We're the first Saturday night back and we're playing in the Edge of the Wedge, so a smaller venue. So that's going to be quite interesting because we don't know at the moment whether it's socially distanced or whether we can cram lots of people in and do that. So yeah, yeah, but uh, going back to Portsmouth, we're not blessed anymore by having that many venues. And the Wedge of Dreams is so great and it's a 500 cap venue and it's so it's, it is still my favourite venue, so we're really, really lucky there. But if we lost that, it would be just pubs, really, and um, a couple of theatres, which obviously you're not going to play as these sort of small bands going through. And then that, that would be it for gigging in Portsmouth, really. You could be looking at Southampton and Brighton, where they've got lots of venues. So, yeah, the wedge is really, really important, and I'm very, very happy that they're 
they've been able to kind of ride it out and, and hopefully things will go smoothly for them now and they'll be okay. You've got to learn how to speak. And we did a live stream um, at the Wedgwood Rooms in an empty venue there and uh, that was just me on acoustic guitar and occasionally on keys and it really made me focus in on the songs and the songwriting. Obviously we couldn't have any people in there so it was it was live from an empty wedge rooms and that was surreal in itself because it's quite a big place and there's no one in it and so walking in and i'm quite familiar with the place i, I go to lots of gigs there and i've played there lots of times in bands and you know quite a lot of the staff there now and they're all lovely and they they let us in and i'm very thankful for that and gave us the kind of run of the run of the place for the afternoon and uh, i had a really good team as well work on it who work on a lot of my visuals and film work and, and that kind of thing so we had a good team to do it and it came across well I hope um, it was very last minute see how the music industry is starting to bounce back considering how hard the past year has been. It really is and um, with restrictions still lifting and different industries being allowed to reopen we'd love to hear what you at home are looking forward to so get in touch with us via either our Instagram page at This Is Portsmouth TV or our Facebook page at This Is Portsmouth. Or you can send us an email at tisp at port.ac.uk. Anyway, keeping with the music theme, we'll now find out a little bit more about a local project musicians are working on for a worthy cause. My name's Matthew Harrison. I'm a folk singer-songwriter under the name Somewhere in the Wildwood and also the lead singer and guitarist of a band, Hometown Show. I've been playing music for about 15, 16 years in and around Portsmouth and getting ready to release a, a compilation album in, in honour of uh, my dear friend Portia and raising money for Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust. So Your Face is an album is a, a charity music compilation. It's to raise money for Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust, which is uh, an important charity to me and an important charity to everyone involved in the project. Um, due to one of my dear friends, Portia, who passed away um, last year quite suddenly with cervical cancer. And um, she was a big supporter of the music scene here in Portsmouth, so we decided to put together this compilation. Uh, myself and her uh, mother Fiona we decided that you know what better way to honor her um, than by putting some music together from people that she loved in the area um, and also raise money for a cervical cancer charity and, and hopefully raise some awareness along the way and that when the thing for the album came up it was like there's only one there's only one name for this and it's got to be your face as an album but it kind of has a Entirely unintentionally, I, I wish I could say it was intentional, but it's kind of got, you know, that, that secondary meaning really as well, you know. The artwork is done by Summer White. I, I put out a thing on Facebook saying, you yeah, know, any friends who can help us out with this, and Summer was first at the list. His work is all over the city and, you know, it's vibrant and unique. And Fiona got in touch with him and sent uh, this picture that, that we had of, of Portia. It's based on an actual photo of Portia, um, which we used for her funeral last year, actually. I think it really represents her. It's, again, it's unique, it's colourful, it's, it's everything that she was about. The response was amazing, you know, people were uh, so willing to help and, and dedicate their time and passion and their, their talent to it. I think at the moment we've got about 12 or 13 businesses um, that, again, as soon as we've asked people, they've come up with things. We've got lots of different female artists on board. It's predominantly uh, female-led. Uh, there's a couple of tracks from myself, just because there's one that I wrote specifically for Portia, which was performed at her memorial service. And it's, you know, it, it's anything from like unreleased songs to de bedroom demos and all that kind of stuff. We just wanted it to feel like it, it was genuinely just a compilation and like 
a, a passionate collection of a variety of songs and sounds and we've got artists like Megan Linford, Chaz Batten and the Tremaine which is amazing I think it's a it's obviously a super important cause um so we've been really fortunate that people have been you know willing to get so involved so Portia and I who the the sort of record is uh, in memory of and um, we met gosh probably about 12 years ago we both worked at Animal which was a skate and surf brand in um in gun war and we also found out that we went to college together she was just a few years sort of below me and stuff and then we eventually found out that we used to live in the same place in london uh, and all these kind of coincidences started happening that that just kind of brought us together as friends and she was such a fun out there crazy charismatic uh woman and she was just so fun to be around and everyone knew her really i mean when she passed away last year all the posts on facebook from musicians and local businesses and bars and friends family there were just so so many responses such a big response because she had such a big impact on people she loved music she was a massive supporter of, of local live bands and things like that. I mean, she would turn up for anything. And she was an amazing friend. Like, I will never forget her. I think about her every single day. Um, her picture hangs up on my on my wall here. And um, at the same time, I know that it's brought a lot of people together and that we're able to do amazing things like this in her name to be able to keep her memory alive. She was a huge personality. She really was, like I say, I mean, when she died, one of the most common things that people used to say was that she lit up a room. Um, and she did. If there was a party struggling to get off the ground, she would walk in and suddenly everything would just, everything would activate, everybody would be energised. It would all just start happening. I think it does really put life into perspective. I know everyone always does use that classic, you know, life is short, but it really is, you know, whether it's a rainy day or a sunny day, I'm the person that's able to, to, to be here and enjoy those when, when sadly some people that we love and we care about are, are not here to experience those. So I think it's about, yeah, honouring them and, and enjoying our lives and, and doing all the things that we said we'd do. Just for me, playing music, getting back out there into the world now, which I know Portia would, would want me to do and she would have wanted to do as well. What a truly lovely thing to do in Portia's memory. And the charity album featuring female artists from Portsmouth is still being put together with all proceeds going to Joe's Cervical Cancer. So keep an eye out for that. Absolutely. And Fiona and Matthew are currently looking for submissions to be included in the album. So if you would like to get involved, they can be contacted via the album's Facebook page. Your face is an album. The D-Day Museum in Portsmouth is the place to go and learn about the very important slice of history and the part of the seaside city played in Operation Overlord. With the anniversary of D-Day coming up on the 6th of June, a new exhibition is set to open very soon, so there's no excuses not to pay a visit. I'm Andrew Whitmarsh and I'm the curator of the D-Day story. So D-Day happened on the 6th of June, 1944, and it's a moment in the Second World War when uh, the Allies, uh, the Western Allies, that means uh, Britain, the US, Canada, and a number of other countries also uh, contributing forces, um, landed in Normandy in France. And this was the, the first stage in liberating that part of France, then liberating the rest of France, and then um, advancing into Germany and defeating the Nazi regime that had uh, taken over half of Europe and bringing the Second World War to an end. The D-Day Museum, as it then was, opened in 1984, and in 2018 it was renamed the D-Day Story because we went through a big redisplay. And then the landing craft that you can see behind me is the, our um, latest uh, change or addition to the museum. So its, it's name um, is L LCT 7074. LCT stands for Landing Craft Tank, so it's a, a landing craft designed for carrying tanks and other vehicles. Uh, owned by the National Museum of the Royal Navy, so we're displaying it in partnership with them and it's part of the visit to the museum. And inside the museum, in the main museum building, uh, you've got the story of D-Day, the preparations for D-Day and the day itself, and then the fighting in Normandy that happened afterwards in the um, June through to August 1944. Um, and then also other displays about the aftermath of that. Um, and what the landing craft adds is um, 
it, it's, a, it's sort of a deeper look really into the naval side of that, into how the troops were transported over there, because this is a real landing craft that was there on D-Day. Um, it, was, it was really present. We know quite a lot about the history of this landing craft and the, the troops that were carried on board it. Um, and also the other great thing is it's um, something that people can explore. So that, whereas inside the museum, um, it's all a kind of more traditional, you could say, display cases and lots of, you know, we've got modern technology as well, films and all sorts and interactives. Um, but the landing craft is something you can actually explore, you can actually walk around and, and physically explore it. So it's a coming at history from a, a different angle, really. We have a charity that supports the work of our museum, uh, the Portsmouth D-Day Museum Trust. And part of what they do is we have a memorial wall um, that's just between the landing craft and the museum. Um, and people can put plaques up there to remember people or units who took part in the campaign. And, and also through doing that, they can help um, support the trust and, and, and that in turn supports us and what we do here at the museum. That looks like such an interesting new exhibit. I can't believe D-Day was 76 years ago and with the anniversary coming up, there's really no better time to find out about such an important piece of Portsmouth history. Do you know what, Alana? We should actually take a trip down there together after we've been to the That's wild That's a great time. idea, a little Portsmouth road trip. So we definitely need to learn some more about Portsmouth's history. Definitely. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. Yep, we'll be going on a brief hiatus, but don't worry, we'll be back on your screens in October. So, what's been your favourite part, Amelia? Oh, well, oh, to sum up a favourite part of the season would actually be really difficult because I've enjoyed it all. I know, it hasn't been a great season. I, I really love Porsche's album. I think that's such a great gesture. It really is, and we would love to hear your favourite parts were at home from all our previous shows or this one as well. You can contact us via our Instagram at This Is Portsmouth TV or our Facebook page at This Is Portsmouth or email us at tisp at port.ac.uk. Speaking of previous shows, all of them are available for you to watch again over on the CCI TV YouTube channel. We have had an amazing show and we really hope you've enjoyed it too. Thanks so much for watching, but for now, this, this is, is Portsmouth. Portsmouth. so much everyone and until next time until next time this, this and this this this, this, this is awesome. Awesome.